Well, let's all welcome Ed Trout as he comes to minister. Can I get this down here? Can, someone, can you bring this down here for me, please? All right, family, it's good to be with you. Just, just bring it to you, sir. Get closer to the people. I want to get close to the family. We all have the same father, different mothers. I have with me my wife that we will be, this year we'll be 47 years married. Just stand up, stand up. Come, come, come here. Everyone uh, always meets my wife and thinks she's so sweet. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm a joker, but my wife's a prankster. She's always, she, she, has, she, she weeps from laughter when she pranks us and the children. Just want you to know before you think, before you feel sorry for her, she, the children breathe when she's gone because she torments them all. But she's a, she's a, she's a character that she loves, grandkids love her and they, uh, she's, she's fought cancer twice and uh, we've been together 47 years now. Good evening everyone. It's wonderful to be here with you guys again. I cannot remember when I was last year, uh, but I, it's wonderful. I don't like the weather so much because in San Antonio, we're already in the 80s. And, and it's beautiful, it's spring there, and it's flowers, and it's everywhere. But praise God, we are here, and I hope and trust God that you guys, each and everyone will be get something from God this weekend. Praise God. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, don't you love her accent? She talks funny. Actually, <laughs> our home language is in English. We don't speak English to each other. We have, even all these years, we still speak our own home language to each other. And I pray in that language too. When I want God to answer my prayers fast, I pray in the language he, he understands. Gibt da jemand Deutsch reden können hier? Diese Ort? No one speaks German here, okay? I'm going to Germany soon. Pardon? Ambition, schön. All right, so tonight I'd like to teach the Word of God, if you'll let me. I count it a great privilege. This is a very special and dear church to my heart for many reasons. I, I value the Satrapis for their lifestyle and their testimony more than the amazing things they teach and depth that they have. Uh, Pastor Ron is a very unique um, insights into so many things. He has the, his own little book of Proverbs built inside of him. And... Uh, not to mention the comedy show that comes out and once in a while, but uh, he's really a remarkable man. I, I love the way that he shows mercy to everybody, and he's got a lot of understanding, great wisdom, but I have, I have a special heart for this church too, because this is a very difficult, the Northeast is a very difficult spiritual area. And so you as the body of Christ and the family of God, it's not an easy journey. And where I come from in the South, there's a church in every corner. And there's so many people, they just, you just go, you just cannot witness in the restaurants because everybody's saved, you know, it's always everyone saved. But uh, it's not so here in the Northeast, they get almost irate if you talk about the Lord to them. And so I value you so much that you've persevered and been faithful. God bless each one of you, faithful to this house and, and part of this family. Tonight I want to talk to you about uh, significance, how that often we feel like we don't contribute all that much or mean that much. But I want to talk to you about a certain lady that I'm very enthralled with. And I've learned over the years that I've studied with the Lord. And for those who don't know, I'm from a Jewish family. And only, only in the last 10 years have, did I figure out that, that what things I assumed that people that were not Jewish would understand, they didn't. And so I've begun to explain and expound from a little bit of Jewish culture that I come from because I have a different view on the Word of God. You understand your Bible is written entirely by Jews. The only one that wasn't born a Jew was Luke, and he was a Greek boy who was born actually, for those of you who didn't know, because I find it amusing, a lot of people don't know where he came from, he came from Antioch. Luke was born in Antioch. He, Antioch was a very vibrant business, flourishing city economically, and people flooded there, and they came, his parents came from Greece, and of course landed him there, and he grew up there, and he was educated as a doctor, but he became a Jew because there were so many synagogues that also Mr. Jews always flock with his money, and so they, they were doing business there, and the Christian church merged. The first 
Christian name was actually evidenced in this church in Antioch, which was so pretty marvelous. And that's where he came from. Luke did. And he got what's known as a proselyte. He became born again to a Christian besides being a Jew. But everything written by Jews from the Jewish culture. Luke definitely writes his stuff from a different culture. I can see the things he does in the book of Luke that the others don't do. He gives, he gives a lot of honor to women, which others don't, because of the culture. And in my journey with the Lord, I've learned that women have always been God's secret weapon. Every time something, every time, not sometimes, every time, something profound happened in God's word, there was a woman somewhere in the mix. And I've learned that God had to use them that way because they were not honored and recognized. And I grew up in a culture where women were honored, and so I didn't understand when the church I began to preach to would have difficulty, women in authority, women in leadership. It was a strange thing for me. There are churches I don't even go to anymore in this country because they forbid me to talk about women in government, in churches, or leadership like that. And I find it very difficult because we cannot afford to lose any ministry because of such a foolish thing. And so uh, just let you know, that's how I stand. But I want to talk to you specifically about a woman that nobody notices. Very special heritage. And I want to tell you, her name is Elizabeth. And uh, she, was, she and her husband, Zechariah, had no children. They, in fact, they were called barren by the word of God. And uh, what makes them very special was they both were Levites. And what that means for you, if you don't understand, of the 12 tribes, a tribe was dedicated by God to ministry. They couldn't all minister at the same time. And when they would serve in the temple as priests, they were allocated to a division as was her husband. What makes the two of them even more profoundly curious is they both descended from the blood of Aaron. Most unusual. They came from Aaron's descendants. So they both would, know, would have been seen as royal. Now, Zechariah was immediately put into the priesthood, and he was in a division. They lived in the southern part of Jerusalem, or southern part of, south of Jerusalem, in the hills of Judea, actually. And so they probably had a little small holding, and little cattle, little feudal animals and such like, and a little village, perhaps. And he was summoned, he was told when he had served for his six weeks in the temple, he had arrived there. What it looks like, you go and find your bunk beds and where you're going to hang out for the next six weeks, and who you're going to share with, and then you're going to look for your different garments, because there's different garments for different functions, and you would have to serve. The main function was in, in the outer court was marriages and, and bar mitzvahs and different ceremonies like that. In the inner court, women weren't allowed. It was where we did sacrifices. and It's a mega thing. Big place, sacrifice. They had water irrigation. It was a big issue because in, when it came to Passover, you could be easily sacrificing 3,000 sheep. It's a lot of uh, <laughs> sacrificing. But behind this altar would be the temple. And it was so that they would allocate. And of course, it happened to fall in Zechariah. They would have these little stones in a bag. And there'd be letters on them. And he got the letter. And it fell on him. The lot fell on him. He'd go into the temple to make the, the offering of, uh, of fragrance to the Lord. And the reason why we have the, this fragrance offering is because all your organs that you have have sinned, not your nose. Your nose is the one that is not so the smell, it was not polluted and was able to carry the prayers of God, prayers of God's people to him. But he would go into the temple, which he didn't really, was reluctant to by the sounds of things. And he, what happens, what it looks like is his massive doors, probably as high as the ceiling, gold, mess, covered in gold. And he'd walk in on the right hand side, you have the, uh, this table with the showbread and the different wine and the of course, this menorah on the left-hand side, menorah is a massive gold, solid gold, can calabrium with uh, seven c candles burning or seven little vestibules burning 24 hours, seven days a week. And you head towards this long curtain, and in front of the curtain was a little altar, which was, of course, the incense altar with four little horns, and you'd burn the incense there. And an angel appears to him. To me, Zechariah was a bit of an idiot. And I say that because you're in the presence of God in the most holy place, in all of Israel, an angel comes and you think to argue with him. <laughs> and only an idiot does that. And that's why the angel struck him dumb. His wife was so different but got no honor or recognition. And I'm going to show you how this all played out. It started with her cousin. Her cousin's name was Mary. 
Now, Mary was betrothed to a man called Joseph. Joseph was a distant relative who actually came from Bethlehem. And he came to work in this tiny village. He wasn't a carpenter. He was a builder. And that's what the Hebrew word means. means builder or construction person of some kind. He didn't just do wood. He did several things. And so he would teach his children. But it was a very small village he went to. And he was an older man, a good man, a very good man. And he was betrothed. And how it works for us in our Jewish culture, uh, we, we... pay a lot of money. If you're a good Jewish Orthodox family, you'll pay a matchmaker when your children are maybe six or seven to start matchmaking to find your uh, child a suitor. I see you shaking your head and thinking this a bit odd, but we Jews think that your Gentile ways are a little bit more odd because you marry someone that you, are, that you don't even love, you lust after them, you marry them, and then you try to fix everything after you got married, and a disaster hits. When the matchmakers work, they don't just match make natural things. They work very hard to find a really suitable family. And I've never seen those families break up, never. So I wonder which one works better. What's love got to do with it? Do with it. <laughs> they grow to love each other, and that's how we, they've done it all the years. But she was matchmaked and she was betrothed. It means she wasn't old enough to get married, but she belonged to someone. So she's, she's maybe 15, maybe. So now her cousin, Elizabeth, is about 40, going on 40. She's barren. She's an older lady. They called them old. They were old. The scripture says they were old, and they were barren. So I would imagine Elizabeth and Mary didn't hang out. They didn't go shopping together. They didn't play TV games. They had nothing in common. They would meet at the different festivals because they were family and maybe even ate together as a whole mass of family But and maybe met her once or twice, but no real interaction with her. Now, this is what happened in a very far distance. I know it seems so small to you, but from where Elizabeth lived, to where Mary stayed, it was at least five or six days walk. And so that you know, there's no buses or trains. And up on a high mountain, this little girl Mary is walking and an angel greets her and tells her that she's blessed amongst women. She's surprised, why would you say that? She's a t- little teenager, why even give him, paying me attention at all? She says, because God, because you're gonna have a baby. I can't have a baby, I'm not even married. No, God's gonna make you pregnant. Can you imagine how bizarre that sounds? If she would go home to her mom and dad and say, Dad, Mom, I've got some good news. I'm pregnant, but it's not Joseph. I'm still still a virgin, in fact. Can you? It sounds ridiculous. And yet that's exactly what happened. And she was smart enough not only to hide the word in her heart, not only was she smart enough to do that, the scripture says that she said to the angel, let it be to me according to your will. And I still would love to graduate my soul into that place where I'm willing to do whatever he says, even if it sounds bizarre. I thought I did until he started asking me things that seemed strange. But either way, while he's talking to her, he says, and look, your cousin is with child. So there was no phones, there were no telegrams or messages, nobody knew. And uh, she had been in seclusion for five months, Scripture tells us. All in the, everything I'm telling you is in the Bible. In the book of Luke, you should all look at me like, whoa, I didn't know. It's all there in the Word. <laughs> I, I, I don't make these things up. <laughs> and so uh, Mary decides when she hears that her cousin is with child, she, for some reason she decides, I want to go see her. They're not big buddies, but this is something she knows is significant. And she must have convinced her dad because her dad's not letting her go to Jerusalem by her little self. Oh, no. And must have taken a few servants and a few donkeys. And it must have been a whole little caravan going down and stopping over. Because when you go, if you travel, you've got to consider, you know, the big thing in Jewish culture is Shabbat. Sabbath. You don't just go, you've got to always plan when you're Shabbat because that Friday evening is of mega importance and the whole day of rest. So you've got to be in the right place and to celebrate. And where are you going to do Shabbat? Who are you going to come? You're going to come to us? What you do? It's a big thing, Shabbat. Already on Friday, as they're telling you, Shalom Shabbat. They're already talking to everybody, greeting you, blessing your day. Sure, it's a big thing. So all of that's reckoned in. And it took several days, and we read and pick it up in the book of Luke. Am I boring you yet? Wait, I'm getting to the fun part now. 
<laughs> in Luke chapter 1, verse 39, at that time Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you bear. And this is what shook my life. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? I was so stunned, the idiot husband argues with the angel, but Elizabeth, who's so unnoticed, says immediately, why, who am I that God's mother would come to see? She's looking down at a child that's half her age. Someone, she's not, someone she doesn't know well, she regards her immediately just by the word of the Lord. Just because she, God, the Spirit is upon her. Not only does she acknowledge who it is, she recognizes this great thing that's going, that's going down. Because she's not showing, she's just pregnant a few weeks now, a week or two maybe. Not much, no, you can't tell. Why am I so favored? She realizes the greatness, the magnitude of this visit, visit right? No small thing. What's going on? Why is this happening? And a, a bell rang in me. I realized that that moment Elizabeth realized that something in all the universe, something supernatural took place. Zechariah is arguing with the angel, but this woman grabs it. And I realized the importance of it because all the prophecies speak about the, the one that goes before Jesus, the forerunner, the one that may, prepares the way, a voice crying in the wilderness. And Jesus said he was the greatest of all men. And of those who can hear it, Elijah has come. Now you understand even to this day in the Jewish culture, when we have Passover, we have, a, we have different th things we celebrate, including wine and just like you do breaking of bread. And then we have different herbs that are bitter reminders of the time. But there's a place set for Elijah because we're expecting Elijah to come back. And Jesus, when he took the bread and gave thanks and he had the, the actual uh, last supper with him, he went to Elijah's plate and wine and brought it and he took that bread and broke it. You've been waiting all for the, this is what you've been waiting for. This, this bread here that Elijah is, is my body. You're celebrating there for Egypt, but this is for me, my body, broken for you. And then this cup you're drinking, do you remember the bitterness is my blood shed for you? And you must do this. Remember this as often as you can. That's where it all came from. And so for the, from a Jewish point of view, the things are, are very much deeper. Everything in a Jewish culture has significance and reason. As does your life. You just don't realize it. You said things, wow, it feels like I've come a full circle. You have no clue how deep the little things that God pays attention to, the smallest detail. He said all things must be fulfilled. If you brought a lamb at, at Shabbat, or sorry, not Shabbat, but at Passover, Pascha, to sacrifice, you'd have to, they, we have a, there's seven gates in Jerusalem, and the one gate in the, on the east, northern side is called the Sheep's Gate, which is very close to the temple, and you'd buy a sheep there perfectly available for you, and go to the Pool of Bethesda, and you'd get yourself cleansed, and go straight to the temple, which is right there, and you'd bring your sheep to be sacrificed. And so this sheep would be inspected, and they'd probably put it on the table, and look at the hoofs, and the, examine each part of the lamb, it had to be without wrinkle, spot, or blem. It had to, be, had to be perfect. And then one wasn't enough. We had to get a second priest to come along and check it too. It had to be okayed by two priests. Once it's okayed, it's taken away from you and put in a place of holding near where it's going to be sacrificed until the next day. When they took the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world, he had to be inspected to be without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. Herod Actually, Pontius Pilate took a basin of water and washed his hands. He said, I can find no wrong in him. The man with the law. Then the king Herod had to say, but what must I punish him? There's nothing wrong with him. It was so intense because all the crucifixes, all the punishment along the road coming to the city, every inscription would say murderer, uh, wife abuser, uh, insurrection. They would, whatever crime was had to be on top. And on the top of Jesus was the king of the Jews. That's how significant every 
part of the Lamb of God had to be. When they had said he was, when they tried him, they took him to the to Antonio Fortress right next to the temple as they would have taken a lamb right before he's going to be slaughtered. So everything fits significantly in exactly as your life. So much happens in your life that's very significant, timely, symbolic. God is very into the details of your life. If he numbers the hair in your head, you can be sure he's involved in a lot of things you don't even realize. There are many things that happen. You just, you just don't get a clue because he's so busy act- actively doing these things. Now, this, uh, this John the Baptist was of great importance for eternity, for, for the life of Christ, for all of us. We needed to have all things fulfilled. And John the Baptist had to, why? Why did we need a forerunner? Well, the, Jesus had to come to his own. He didn't come to the, Jesus did not come to Gentiles. He came only to Jews because his disciples would go to the Gentiles. That's biblical. That's what he said. I was sent to the Jews. That's what he said. For the last of Israel, I cannot give to the dogs what belongs to the children. Dogs are unbelievers. I cannot give to the outsiders. This is for the children. So to make the Jews aware and have no excuse to make all Israel alert that the Savior was coming and understand there are 22 prophecies of scripture in the book of Isaiah that they would read. She'll be born. He'll be born from a virgin. Signs, wonders, and miracles will happen. It's all in there. The blind eyes are open. The deaf will hear. He, exactly those words are in the book of Isaiah. So now for every reason to have no excuse that, that God had to send someone to go ahead to preach repentance, to awaken them to the voice of God, back to their God. They're so mindful of all their little problems. And that at that particular calendar, from the beginning of Israel to the very day today, that particular time of Jesus was the most prosperous. It, Jerusalem was the most beautiful. It was a second temple period. It was the most, mag- Herod had built the most beautiful temple. He had built a temple mount the size of 14 football fields that's there today. And the temple was there in every way. It was so big, bridges and, and palaces. It was, mag- the whole city was magnificent. And the Israelites are very proud of it. They felt the oppression of the democratic society. The Romans came to free and take away the control. And there was so much politics going on. They were more focused focused on that. But John came shouting, repent, turn. And he, people responded to him. They came out in the wilderness looking for it. They came to be baptized. Baptism was a very common thing. We got baptized different ceremonies. We have a mikvah, which is a pool that's holy, which you go down in and come up. It's a cleansing process. But the, John the Baptist spent the time with the Hessenes, which are even more eccentric than that. They wore long white dresses. Am I boring you? They will lie. I don't want to get too, too Jewish for you. And I've got to get my knife out and help you guys. But anyway, <laughs> women, the, yeah, preach it, she says. Okay, the knife or the, the oh, not that. <laughs> but the, the, the Hessenes wore long white. They were like monks. They didn't get married. They lived out in the wilderness. They wrote, the, wrote, the, uh, wrote those uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. And John the Baptist spent time with them. They baptized every day. They were sanctifying themselves. They were a little extreme with everything. And that's where he got that thing. But So he preached and they all would get repentant. Israel got aware. They even asked him, are you the Messiah? He said, no, there's one coming greater than I am. And he promised. Now, to have that caliber of a man who never got married, who never went to the movies, he didn't have any pleasure in life at all, to be 30 years old, to start a ministry like that, it took someone, not of Zechariah's quality, but of Elizabeth's. But nobody noticed her. Because I know when she said, who am I, who am I, that the mother of my Lord will come to me. For her to say that, it means that from that moment, that child had every bit of Bible school from that girl. That woman would sing the songs of God to him night and day. She would prophesy of him. She would pray of him. She would teach him. She would discipline him in the ways of God. She groomed him for the, her purpose. She spent all her life grooming that man for the message and the journey he was to go. So she was not ever celebrated. And there are people in this room that you've done so much for God without ever being noticed. Did so much for other people for the name of the Lord and without realizing it, And people didn't see it but God. And it's written in the book of remembrance. And you feel so unnoticed and insignificant. God's ecology is not like that of man. I've heard people say, talk about a big ministry. And I always ask, what what is that? Well, they're on TV and they they have all these thousands of um, people following them. And they have airplanes of their own. That's what makes a big ministry. That's not a big ministry. That's just a very popular one. 
And that's not what Jesus aimed at at all. His whole technique was to get away from that. When the 5,000 chanted, he got rid of them. When he was in Jerusalem and they told him, you're baptizing more than John the Baptist, he said, let's get out of here. Let's go back to, let's go back to Galilee. He was not going to promote a ministry. He was more into focusing and doing the kingdom of God. That's why he prayed in John 17, verse 4, Father, I have done all you have given me to do. I've listed, had a list and I marked it off what I was supposed to do. Now, each one of us sitting here today, not one of you are here by chance. Not one of you just happened to be here tonight. God's always had his eye on you. He wouldn't force you, wouldn't ever invade your free will, but it was always his plan for you to be here. He's always had a plan for your life, but you cannot be measuring yourself with someone else. Only fools, Second Corinthians says, compare themselves to other people. You've got to be aware of what God has given you to do, and are you fulfilling that? Because sometimes, like Elizabeth, nobody even knows you the life. No one celebrates you. You may have royal blood like from, from Aaron. You may be a, Levi, a Levite, and you may have all those goods and be used of God significantly, but only God is going to reward you. Because it's eternal. Are you, are you, if you're needing the applause of man, there's something broken on the inside of you. Because men's applause, men's <laughs> approval doesn't do anything for you. Does nothing. It's all empty. What you need is God's approval. You need it to please the Lord. He's the one. And it's the, it's the devil's trick. You know, the devil has, God has a plan for your life. But the devil has a, has a scheme. Three different scriptures in the New in Testament talk about the schemes of the devil. <coughs> The devil doesn't have just a, a plan. He's got a whole scheme in motion. And usually when you're born, by the time you're born, the scheme's already, already going. If, whether it's rejection, whether it's shame that the devil tries to... You, they, you always react or feel the pain or always get hurt in that area. You don't get hurt in other areas. It's whatever the scheme is in your life, that's where the devil will get you. When Samson came down... Because you can imagine this man is so strong, he had a destiny. It was never God's plan for him to die blind under rubble. But he had a scheme in his life of betrayal. When his wife betrayed him, he was like a little baby, folded like a cheap tent. When she betrayed him, he went back to his mommy. He's at his wedding. Waiter, he, so he, he would not give up. His dad begged, Samson, don't marry that girl. And he would not. I love her. I want her. I, nothing matters more. And then when she betrays him, she, he leaves her and goes back to mommy and daddy. <laughs> what a man. And he's gone a long time. When he comes back, he's cooled down. He finds his best friend sleeping with his wife. Now his betrayal has escalated. The devil knows what to feed. If he's if he got the scheme in your life, he's going he's to make it worse. If you don't let God heal your heart and bring forgiveness, he's going to feed that scheme until it becomes the stronghold in your life. Got quiet in this place. Yeah, and that's what brought him down. Why would anybody with a bit of a brain, with a woman that he's supposed to be now in love with, this Delilah, if he says, she says, what's the secret? So again, his wife wanted to know secrets too. What's, what's the secret to your strength? And he lies to her and he says, every time you have a new string, I'm as weak as any other man. Wakes up in the morning, has got all this new string on him. So, Samson, do you get a clue? Do you know why you have new string? Do you know where that came from? How, you know, once I can still, but three times, really? What are you smoking, boy? <laughs> Why would someone do that? Because deep in his heart, he wanted to believe somebody would not betray him. You, that's why a woman that's married to an abusive husband divorces him and marries one just like that again. That's why girls marry their, their fathers who didn't do right by them and keep doing the same thing because they're trying to fix the first one. When in fact you surrender your heart and God fixes it. You got very quiet in this place, y'all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> So I'm celebrating today a woman called Elizabeth because she was such a champion for the Lord. And they're champions in this room. People that get on your nerves may talk too much, may even seem a bit silly to you, but they're significant in God's plan. Because God measures us all very differently. 
And some of the things we see as insignificant are vitally. When I sat in the little lounge there and I heard Rena singing and the band going, I thought, <laughs> they've been going so many years so faithfully. And I, I appreciate and I admire people that can be faithful. That's a tremendous quality right there. That's not up and down and here today, gone tomorrow. But many of you have been in this church a while and you're faithful. And God rewards faithfulness. God does. Rewards you. Maybe unnoticed, you may feel insignificant. You may come from a marriage or a home where you, it's nothing bad, but there's no real honor. But God will honor you. Your insignificance, like Elizabeth, God saw that. And I tell you, there's 144,000 Jesus, the Revelation talks about, and there's no names given. I'm convinced that people that are like Elizabeth, that are unknown, that did great exploits for the Lord. So wherever your life's taken you, wherever you are today, don't measure yourself the way man measures. Look at yourself the way God looks at you. Examine your own heart and see where you really are in your journey with God. Because sometimes the most insignificant little meeting at the grocery store, the one packing your groceries that talks to you, is of great importance to God. People have entertained angels without realizing. That's how sometimes they come across so insignificant. This activity all around you every day, pay attention. Pay attention. Mary, the, the Mag, Mary Magdala, who was crazy about Jesus and his, and his ministry, went to his grave. The first one at his grave, she walked right past him. She was going to him, but walked right past him because she wasn't expecting him to be standing next to her. Two men walking on the road to Imias, either side of him, talking about him, didn't recognize him because they weren't expecting him to be there. The fishermen weren't expecting Jesus at the side of the, uh, said, many of you caught anything. They didn't expect him to be there. I want you to expect angels. You're always so worried about the devils. There's more angels than there are devils in your life. And they're always busy. They're always working. Jesus said, I'm always working. My father's always working. God is always busy in your life. Somewhere. Don't measure little mishaps or inconveniences as something wrong. It's just life. And then the devil's going to throw every curveball he can at you to distract you from being alert and careful and spiritual and attentive to God. While you're breathing on this planet, while you're walking around, God has got a plan for you. Have you got problems? Oh, I bet you have. I bet you're a hopeless, bad, simple Christian that's been redeemed. Because if you weren't, you wouldn't be here today. If you were the best good person, God would have probably passed right by you. You didn't need him. He said it was the sick that needed the position. Did he say that? So you don't have to let the devil try and put guilt and shame on you. God already knows all your struggles. He's not stressed by your struggles. He didn't even set Paul free. Paul sought him three times about the thorn in his flesh. He didn't say, I'll got you. I'll get you free. He said, my grace is enough. I got you covered. No, I don't want to be covered. I want you to set me free. No, I got you. It's okay. You, no, I don't want to. he was struggling. God's not stressed by your struggles. He's stressed by your bad spirits. If you've got an unforgiveness, hatred, it's the wickedness of heart that God hates, not the weakness of man. If you're weak and struggling, God's got a lot of patience for you. You're very quiet in this place. I'm not sure why. I hate the excitement. It's overwhelming. Whew. Yeah, take it down, guys. You're overwhelming me now. Yeah. So um, I was a pastor for many years, and then God called us to, me to the prophetic ministry. It was very traumatic for me. I remember the Lord waking me up at night. We had two children at the time and told me I must raise up prophets and teach people in the prophetic. And I, I said, God, you got the wrong person. I, I don't even know what that is, let alone teach it. And then he said to me, I want you to live by faith. I said, that was, the, that was the deal breaker for me. I said, I can't live by faith. I've got a wife and children. That's what I did. I told him that. I, I responded. I even said if I was single, I would have gone. Some months went by, and on the way to church, the same wife and my middle child, who's now middle, was then a baby, uh, we were crossing a railway track on, near the church building, uh, as we always did, and the vehicle we were in died on the track. And there was nothing I could do to move that vehicle. Started, it just would not, it was stuck. And the train came and hit us, and we got away just in time. And this voice said to me, so you're very responsible. You almost killed your family. Give them to me. I'll take better care of them than you. 
and so for more than 40 it's, it's the gospel truth I'm telling the truth right uh, she told me the other day she said I even remember the car door hitting me as the train hit it uh, pushing me so she even remembers that too. And, and so does Charmaine she remembers a lot of that thing very clearly you don't forget we, we heard we would shiver every time we heard a train sound for years after that but uh, um, you know Jonah needed a, a big fish a train's what got me <laughs> but I've done this for 40 odd years and uh uh, the, the call that I have is to really raise, and I'm at the age now where I see the end of my tunnel getting close. So I'm doing as hard as I can, as much as I can to impart what I have learned. I've averaged about 28 church meetings a month, even now. And that's besides all the coaching, counseling. I did three meetings this morning, <laughs> three different uh, Zoom meetings this morning. But uh, I'm always ministering and uh, passing on. I've learned so much. I, the older I become, the more I've learned and I understand and I want to pass it on. At the moment, I'm literally dissecting exactly what a prophet is in the New Testament to define it correctly because the word prophet appears 250 times in the New Testament and uh, apostle only 72 times and pastor only once. That's very odd to me. So there's definitely a reference to the prophetic or prophets. We have, we think he's the only, then they, they, the Bible talks about the prophet talking, not prophesying. The, the two or three prophets speak. It says in the first Corinthians and then in, in Acts, it says Silas and Judas themselves being prophets said much to encourage. And there's so much they say. So I'm exploring all the correct biblical understanding. I think we've had some strange ideas of what ministry should look like. And uh, there's probably a whole bunch of prophets in this room that need to not only pro prophesy, but every Christian should prophesy. Yes. Every Christian. It should be a daily part of our lives. It's a, it should be a natural part of our lives. And we should understand how to apply it, not to be led by it, <clears throat> how to assess it carefully and to apply it carefully and use it and not live by it. We live by the, by the word of God and by the life of the church. Church life is the way God instituted all that but that's what I do and I do encounters and we just launched a prophetic school called the called the Academy it's on our website it's a spiritual family that we train and equip and try to do all we can to impart and we have a whole lot of coaches on there now we've been training that will coach people we're actually launching we launched it in Africa uh, in the beginning of the Lord now we're launching it officially in a couple of months here but it's, it's running already for Americans but it's we're not making it well known yet but so when, I've got no agenda because my, I'm on my way out. My time is running out here. So I want to give it to the next generation, the next lot of people, the, the younger generation, so they can carry on with it in a healthy way. Because there have been some too weird prophetic people that have done too many weird things. It's not the prophet's job to prophesy politics, weather, or catastrophes, but to, to build the kingdom, to equip the saints. That's what the Word of God says. Would you agree, Bishop? Bishop? We're looking at you, Bishop. Yeah, I agree. Okay. A bishop is a leader of leaders. And he's always been a pastor of pastors. He always has been. If he had been in the South, he would have had a church of two or 3,000 easily. His caliber of ministry. And I've watched him labor for years and down there in Boston area. And it always amused me that how limited it was. And I realized how hard this area is spiritually. It's just hard, but the Lord, you don't need a lot. And Jesus didn't try to reach the whole world. He didn't try to reach 12 with all of his heart to get them prepared to send them out. And they were a bunch of idiots. <laughs> they weren't even the best men you could find. I mean, really, you had, you know, you had Peter who was really not smart. I mean, he's, he, Jesus comes walking in the water and they say, they all, it's a ghost. Don't be afraid. It's me. And the first words Peter says, if that's you, he just said, it's me. It's like, what's, they're up in the mountain, they're up in the mountain with Elijah and Moses. And what would you do if you were with Jesus on the mountain with Elijah and Moses? I know what I'd be doing. I'd be saying, Moses, get in here, get in here, come, come, come. That's what I'd be doing. You know what Peter's doing? Sh shall I, shall I build a tent? What? He said, well, not the smartest man I ever met. And then James and John, sons of thunder, want to call down destruction. <laughs> what was the, John was a character, you know. He writes in his book, the, the one who Jesus loved. Five times he writes that. Nobody else comments on that. No one thinks that he's special, but he does. <laughs> it's true. 
Uh, not mentioning Thomas. Everyone thinks Thomas is a doubter. He's so much more than a doubter. If you've ever watched Winnie the Pooh, there's a little donkey called Eeyore. <laughs> That's Thomas. Whiny, complainy, negative. In the book of John, chapter 10, Jesus is saying he's going up to Jerusalem to raise Lazarus. And he says, you can't go. They're going to kill you there. He says, no, we must go. With, you know, we're safe. And, and this is, this is uh, Thomas's words. Well, let us go with him, that we can die with him. <laughs> I mean, it's like, you, this, Jesus, you, you picked him? You, really, you picked him? It's the best you could do. And then there's, of course, Judas, who didn't even come from Galilee. The only one that came from another, another place is Cariot. And he got the books. He had to do the books. Funny thing, because Matthew was the one that was supposed to do the books. Because he was the, he was the tax collector. But Jesus gives you money to see what it will do with your heart. Because nothing will expose your heart faster than money. Money changes you. And it changed him, all right. It made, that's what made him do what he did. And then there's Matthew. Matthew was an interesting fellow. He was a Levite. Mark calls him a Levite. His brother, James, is also a disciple. The other James, it's both of the same father. But he was, being a Levite, they would have trained him or sent him to school to be teacher of the law, a Pharisee. But he comes back and decides, I'm taking my education, Dad, and I'm going to be a tax collector. I speak several languages. I'm smart. I've learned. I've got education. Let me make some money. These rabbis are so poor. I don't want to be like that. I want to have some money. So he becomes a tax collector, and his dad and mom take it as a very sincere heartbreak. There's no mention of his family anywhere. He has a big banquet for Jesus, and his parents are nowhere to be found. Doesn't even mention them at all, ever. Matthew. Interesting book, his book, Matthew. It's the only book that stays in Hebrew for 200 years. Every other book is in Greek. But Matthew's people and his disciples kept it in Hebrew. To, to, it's meant for the Jews. He was very focused on the Jews, trying to prove about the Messiah. So he had a, still a Levite in him. Still a Levite was inside of him. Very interesting personality. Am I, am I not boring you yet? No. <laughs> it's all very interesting. They're all in your Bible. It makes your word, the word come alive to you if you know who you're dealing with. And you know the actual people, the, the people he interacted with on all different levels. You know, Peter didn't come from Capernaum or Capernaum, as you call it. He came from Bethsaida. And uh, he married a girl whose dad was dead and a wealthy man. But at least I know this because you don't move in. Jewish custom, you don't move into your mother and father-in-law's houses. It's not done unless there's no father-in-law. The mother-in-law needs someone to look after her. And we know she was there because Jesus raised her from, the, from being sick to serve on him, to wait on him, the mother-in-law. And there was no father-in-law ever there. So that's what happened. And Peter married her. He was about 24 when he met Jesus. Uh, John was about 18. Matthew's about 27, 28. They're all at different ages. And they all died as martyrs except John. John was old. On the Isle of Patmos. I still wonder about him in his 90s writing the book of Revelation. Because I think that's where you saw all the monsters at that age. He's a bit confused, maybe. Oh, who knows? <laughs> 90 years old writing the book of Revelation. That's pretty scary to me. Yeah. Don't you write books when you're 90. Please don't do that. <laughs> write them now, quickly, while you still have some sense. <laughs> All right. All right. So, is there anybody, and you may not lie because you're in church. If you're in church, it's double penalty for lies. If you've never had a prophetic word in your life, personally, no one's ever prophesied out of you, raise your hand quickly. I'm a anybody. All that words. That's wonderful. That means a very healthy church then. Wait. Anybody? Dude with a beard. Are you as strong as you look? It will make a difference in the prophetic word. I'll be very careful. <laughs> you like my joke still? Yes. What's your name, sir? Woo! Woo! You've been eating some oatmeal for sure, dude. <laughs> Bro, my grandkids call me bra. <laughs> That's the strangest thing. Grandkids just be called bra. I'm your grandfather, I'm not a bra. I don't wear one. <laughs> they call the grandmother bra too. So. So, uh, uh, what, what do you do? What do? You're an architect. You've got all those muscles in you, and that's what you do. It's, it's amazing. They can bench push three, uh, 300 kilograms or pounds, if it is, and that's what they do. They do ar architecture, right? They do paperwork, right? Are you married? Would you like to be? Well, let me just get your picture on the internet. And I'll, and I'll... <laughs> 
Do you come to this church? Oh, probably the last time after this, right? <laughs> I'm so weird. <laughs> I even weird myself out. <laughs> but I, I do love your heart. I love who you are. There's a very strong sense of uh, integrity. You're a very loyal friend, very upright. You've been betrayed several times by several people, different levels, from relationship with women to friends. It's been a story of your life, and yet you are not like that. That's the most amazing things. Um, a lot of people are good communicators, and you're a good communicator until you're upset. When you're upset, you just shut down. You, nothing comes out of you. It's the most crazy thing, and uh, you're not a, by nature an angry person, but you've done angry things because you were hurt. And uh, the, you're as strong as you look and as tough as you are, you've got a very tender heart. Very tender heart. And the devil tried to stop you being born. There was a real onslaught as a baby to try and kill you. And God protected you all that time. Because he had a plan for your life. And you're an architect. I'm sure you're a good one. Uh, but the truth is that you're very called to help people because you have a tremendous gift with young adults and teenagers. It's a gift from God. You're a coach. You're a life coach. And you're going to help people. You've got such a integrous person and you will finish what you start and uh, you will really nurture those people. That's who you are. But you've got to start choosing your friends because every once in a while you had the wrong friend. You had a sour friendship that dragged you down the wrong way and just didn't fit in your life. You were trying to be a cool guy. You've got to find the place you're loyal to, not the wrong people. And so from this downwards, let it be a difference. You know the ways of God because it comes down your bloodline. You wandered away from it, but you've come back and you're looking for God again because it comes from your bloodline. You were always sensitive to God. You were always God's property. You always were in God's eye. You'll never escape because God has his hand on you. He's got your name in his book. He's, con he's concerned. He's con focused. He's all about you more than you realize. You've even used the phrase, somebody's watching out for me because you've seen little things that God has done always on your behalf. Your good heart and the good deeds you've done have not gone array. God has seen them. He's written them down in his book of remembrance. You've been kind to a lot of people in your life. And God has watched that and seen that. And you're a good man. He's restoring and helping you as a sign to you. There's been a, I don't know, with a car, what is something financially that needs to be fixed and adjusted. And God is intervening supernaturally for you to show you what he can do over and above. But you kind of accepted the loss. But God says, watch what I'm going to do on your behalf. Watch. Watch what I'm going to do. Thank you. Nice to meet you, sir. All right. Thank you. That's what I'm saying. <clears throat> What's the drummer boy's name? Yeah, only one drummer tonight. <laughs> Dude, somebody drew in your arm. <laughs> huh? I, uh, give me a knife, I'll take it off. <clears throat> so, what's your name? Zach. Zach. Zach? Yeah. Like Zach Attack? Are you married, Zach? Uh, just married. Yep. Yeah, you look, you got that look. <laughs> Young married couples get a look, you know, <laughs> tired but happy. <laughs> Where is she tonight? Uh, wow, what happened to the fresh new love? What happened to that? <laughs> she shouldn't leave your side, right? What's her name? Uh, her name is Abby. Abby? Abby. Right, how long are you guys married now? Seven That's yeah. wonderful. So it's really old news for you, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like your heart. You're kind of a, a spoiled brat in some ways because you've, had, <laughs> because you've had a lot of love and a lot of... Uh, the Bible says to him, is given much as much expected. You've had a lot given to you. You've had a lot more privileges others have, others have had. You've had someone that's loved you and sheltered you your whole life. And, and, uh, but you've always had a good heart, always a kind heart and a good spirit. You just The only thing that you have to temper and watch carefully is the... The fastness you move sometimes. You do things without thinking it all through. You just, you're impulsive. You'll just do it quickly. But the heart is pure. Your heart, there is not a lick of evil inside of you. Not a lick of evil. The second thing I'm going to ask you to start learning to do is to finish everything you start. You have so many projects and things in the, in the shack back there you were going to fix and do and you're going to have all that projects and you just nothing came of it. You were going to do it and you still want to, but you've got to finish things that you start. If you're not going to purpose, then you mustn't start it. That's what God's saying. And if you get to that habit of your life, God's call and his anointing on your life for ministry will find its place in you. And you will fulfill all your destiny. But you are given to God. You are given to God. You belong to God. It's written. It is written. 
that your destiny shall be in the things of God and ministry full time. That's God's plan for you. And so your wife, God gave you the champion. You almost missed the mark. You almost missed the wrong one. This was the one that God chose. And if anybody doesn't keep you straight, that girl will keep. Oh, Lord, you thought she's so sweet. You don't know what you got, girl. Boy, wait, you, she's going to straighten and keep your wagon going straight because she's strong like that. But uh, she needs you more than you realize, and she, you need her. It's that simple. It's a, it's a match made in heaven. It's going to be very blessed and flourish. That's all I want to tell you, sir. You're going to finish some education that just for the sake of finishing it, it's a part of the plan, and that God's going to bless it. He's got all kinds of programs for you, Zach Attack. <laughs> nice to meet you, Zach. All right, thank you. <laughs> Bye. Yeah. This is so much fun. <laughs> Everyone's going, I hope he picks me, or I hope he doesn't pick me. I'll be much sure. <laughs> What's your name, sir, with a beard in the corner over there near the door? Ready for escape? <laughs> What's your name? Rob. Rob. And next to you is your daughter? <laughs> Girlfriend. <laughs> did, did you know that, sir? <laughs> Are you born again, sir? You gave your heart to Jesus because you owe God. I mean, you really owe God. He saved your life. He saved you from a lot of trouble already. And you've done some, you've done some stupid things. We all have, but you've done some extra ones. And, <laughs> but at the same time, you've been also, you've been, you've been kind to people too, just like these other two guys. You've, been, you've done some good things too. You've lost everything. But God is going to restore to you. He's going to restore all of it step by step. Uh, You've got to think before you jump. You know, the anger that you display, that, that, that sometimes it can get really bad, that's not who you really are. You weren't born with that. That came from your childhood. Because nothing you could do was right, and you saw someone treating someone else very badly. And it, it scarred your heart and soul, and it, wore, wore, it warned you, and it went deep inside of your soul. But by the word of the Lord, I'm loosening you from it today. That the man of God will arise in you, the way it's supposed to. You made a promise and a vow to God because he rescued you. You better keep your promise because you were born for this. You're going to change a lot of lives, a lot of lives. That's you. There's really a good guy. You're a good friend to have. Ma'am, I'm glad you're dating him. You're just a little bit different to him, uh, a little more detailed. He's not that detailed. So I want to warn you. And he forgets to tell you stuff. It's just it's not a no real, just is he? And he's, not, he's a bit of a slob too. He's not always tidy. <laughs> And you're not. You, everything has to be exactly, you even, you even eat tidily. You just, everything about you is tidy and organized. And, and he's, but you've got a wonderful heart and you put behind you what's behind you. All the sorrow and hardship is not going to repeat itself. You're trying to protect yourself. Let go and let God be in control of your life. Please. That way your life will be so much better. Yes? Okay. There's someone you love very much that you feel you're trying to fix the relationship and their heart. Leave it to God now. Next to you is a man with a tan. What's your name, sir? Henry. Henry! Where are you from, Henry? Originally from Nigeria. From Nigeria. Which city in Nigeria? Okay. South. How long have you been here? On and off since 2004. To, on and off. And next to you is your loving wife. <laughs> loving. Did you know that she was loving? Henry, did you know she was loving? <laughs> Are you thankful for a loving wife? Oh, I am. Every day, all right. You, you can kiss her all over. You, that's how you, that's right, because that's love, what a loving wife needs, right? What's your name, loving wife? Tamari. Tamari. Yes. And how long are you guys married? That's a long, t <laughs> it's a long time. It's a long, it's a long time. You've got a lot of your father's nature. You have a lot of ability to carry responsibility and work a plan. And uh, things get you upset, but you, t you, th you think it through. The, and the next day, you've got a plan. you always got to solve a problem. But the difficulty with you is you take on everybody's problem on your shoulders. And it must stop today. There's some things you're not supposed to fix. There's some things you're not supposed to resolve. It's very hard for you to do that. Let it go, girl. Let God do it. Let them sort it out themselves, if you can do that. As a sign to you, when you, you're sitting comfortably there, but there's a physical 
ailment in you as I'm speaking to you. When you get up off that seat, and you're not telling people, you're keeping it to yourself, you're trying to, trying to ignore it, but when you get up off that seat, you will see and feel, physically feel, that God has healed you. As a sign to you that God is for you. And on your, the second thing is that you've been waiting for a check that belongs to you, that's supposed to come in the mail for a while as a refund, something is supposed to happen, and it's, 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 it's going to come as a total surprise, like, oh, there it is, and it's a sign to you, it's another sign. The third sign is you haven't, there's a family member that you haven't heard from for years that's going to suddenly call you out of the blue, find you and track you down, and want to rekindle friendship as part of God's plan. What's the person behind you's name with a, with a face? You know when you smile and laugh, you've got no eyes. <laughs> Don't want to drive and laugh. It's not a good thing. <laughs> What's your name? Ryan. Ryan? Yeah. And next to you is your? Wife. Thank you for marrying him. What's your name? Abigail. Abigail. Do you know Abigail in the Bible? She was beautiful. Her husband was an idiot in the Bible. <laughs> not this husband, but uh, her first husband. The second husband was the king. Yeah, she was quite a little lady, that Abigail. Quite an interesting lady. What do you do, sir? Um, I don't know. You don't know you're a pastor? <laughs> That's how they are. They don't know either. <laughs> what? I schedule her and I talk to her ministry. I, I love your heart. I love your spirit. I love your unselfish ways. You're a little intense for me. Uh, you get to make you get very tense about everything. You need to take it down a notch. You need to breathe a little bit and and have a little fun too, and, and just not be so intense. Let God you put your faith in motion. If you're striving and working a thing, God's not working it. So you got to let this let it chill chill a little bit. You're trying so hard. What's really driving you? You're going to be surprised when I tell you now. You're trying to prove to someone in your family from your childhood that you're not a loser, that you are hearing God that you are called to the Lord. But really, you don't have to prove it to anybody because God's got you. God's got you. And he's whispering my ear, I must tell you these words. He is pleased with you. God is pleased with you. You have nothing to be concerned about. So if God before you, who can be against you? It's that simple. So you can just stop trying so hard. You're very smart and you're very capable. There's not much you can do. And you're excellent with people, excellent. Don't try to prove it. Let it happen naturally for you, okay? As for you, my sister, you did make a mistake. You married the right guy. You worry about a lot of things because you're very intense. You forget to eat sometimes. You need to pay attention to everything in your life carefully because you, you also stress about the wrong things. And you come from a, from a, I don't want to call it abuse, but you come from a, a very strained situation growing up. And, and this is not where it's going to be. He's a very kind and good guy. He is really a good guy. He's going to take good care. God's favor is on him. So whatever happens, it'll always work out because God favors him. It's that simple. If God picks someone, God picks them, and he picked him. And you're in a good place. Are you, do you have children? How many? Looking at him, don't, don't you know? You got, oh. So it's the same too, right? You, so, so, so what are their names? Give me the ones first, the eldest one first. Cora. Cora. And how old is she? Cora is eight. Cora is pretty strong-minded. She can be very strong-willed about some things, and uh, she doesn't always talk. But when she does, she can, and when she wants something, she doesn't want anything less than that. And she will fight for it, and she'll make you crazy for what she wants. But she's very, very upright, very noble heart, noble heart, very smart child. Doesn't she can be very hardworking one day and not so hard the next, but you've got to keep her, t teach her the even Stephen thing. And the second child? You don't, you don't know your child's name? Yeah. That's sad. <laughs> okay, Ma'am, do you know the child's name? Elijah, sorry. Elijah, sorry. Okay, good. <laughs> now that child's everybody's friend. Everybody loves that child. Personality extraordinaire and just happy. Never going to get that child down. Just happy, 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 happy. And bring a lot of joy. Are you planning a third child? This is definitely a third child in your household. I doubt if the child comes from your womb, though. This child is definitely another, someone you have to raise and help that's broken, that needs help. And so that's what's going to happen. You're a good mom, um, and you, you're, a, you're a very good dad. You need to know that. You're an excellent dad. You're a good man. 
You're a good man. All right, if you were my son, I'd be very proud of you. I'd be very proud of you. Just your upright heart, this beautiful heart. Good man. Okay, good. Let's go where the sinners are. <laughs> come, Louise, come help me. Zoek uit, zoek. Ach, come now, you can help me. Help not one or two persons. That's my language. I'm asking her to come and help pick someone. She's, ah. Zoek uh, a son there out. Told her to find a sinner. Music. All right. Is that Rena's child? Uh, is it his child too? I'm just checking. I forgot his name. Uh, you no, know, your name. Mike. Mike. Okay, Mike and Rena. I remember yours. Can't forget that name. All right, so your name is Asher? Dude, how old are you? 12. Big aspirations, this boy. Big dreams. He's going to be the president, he thinks. But nevertheless, he, God's got plans for him. He's smart and he's ordered. And he, he will spend your money and keep his. He's got it all organized the way he's <laughs> very Mr. Economical. Mr. Economical and don't waste and I'm saving up and Lord knows what else. <laughs> so um, he's going to study. He's smart. He's very ordered by nature. He's mathematical. He has, a, he has not a... a word side like books and things is more side of mathematical uh, scientific side to him and uh, he likes it in order and he like he's, he's not needy he, girls will not wear him down he'll just he, they want them to serve him he'll never run after them it's just not his nature and he's he built a lot of confidence in that boy and so the, what's your name young lady Avi uh, who would give you such a strange name <laughs> were you were you sober when you did that Aviala, where did you hear that name? It's a female version of Aviala. Okay, I feel so much better about that now. <laughs> you understand? Every time she tells someone her name, she's got to spell it every time. <laughs> every time. So, how old are you, girlfriend? Ten. Are you married? <laughs> she's got a lovely heart. I do want to warn you, though, that people will always underestimate her because she's far more brilliant far more, st much stronger, far more powerful than she comes across. She can be very disoriented at times and she can be even a little bit untidy and disorganized, but inside of her, inside of her, greatness. I just want to warn you, she's not anything you think, she's way beyond all that, but you never rec no one recognizes it. Not even the, the ones that educate her, they don't, they don't see it. But uh, God's hands on you. Any of the two kids? That's the best you could do, Rena? <laughs> Oh, I feel better about that now. <laughs> Who else you want to pick? Okay, the lady behind him. The lady behind him. What's your name, young lady, behind him? Hi, Tiffany. I had breakfast at Tiffany's. <laughs> Was that a movie? Yeah. Something like it, confused. Okay, are you married, Miss Tiffany? I'm not. Would you like to be? No, I've been there and done that, huh? <laughs> yeah, bought the T-shirt and all that stuff, yeah. So, <sighs> God didn't call you to survive. He called you to be victorious. But you have to let go of yesterday. You have so much anger and, and hurt, un, understandably. Nobody holds you responsible for that other than you, for your benefit. You have to forgive. If you forgive those that deserve forgiveness or ask for it, that's what the world does. But you've got to forgive those that don't deserve it at all. Because you suffered more than you could even tell people in this room. People wouldn't even believe half the things that happened to you and the abuses and the awful stuff. And if you hadn't run for your life, you wouldn't be here today. It's that simple. Nobody would believe it in this room, but God. God was watching over you all that time. And the best of your life is still to come. The best. But you've got to let God heal and fix your heart. It's that simple. Do you understand? You had a lot of bad decisions when it came to males growing up. You, didn't, you always chose the wrong people. And you'll never do it. Now you shut it all down. But you've got to let God lead you in the right way. There's good people out there too that will treat you with honor and respect. And the Lord says he's your advocate and lawyer. He's not, there's not, it's not finished. He's fighting the case for you. And you're going to win this. You're going to win this. That's simple. Pick someone else. She's doing a good job, isn't she? Uh, the last row on the left, that guy. There, the, the last... Person.
the man with the glasses and the face and the hairstyle like mine and the goatee and, and someone painted on his arm too, on his arms, on his arms. So what's your name, sir? My name's Nick? Nick? Nick the Trick. <laughs> come on, here, come on, sit, it's clear, thank you. And uh, so are you married? Yes, ma'am. And do you know her name? Alyssa, you don't sit there. She's lovely. Wow. Did you think he had money? Is that what happened? You thought he was rich? He fooled you, didn't he? I also make jokes. So what do you do for a living, sir? I am a planner. Okay. Here's the thing. God's changing your mind about how you see yourself. The devil doesn't even attack you much, but you do it all by yourself. You're carrying a lot of stuff. And this whole Christian thing, you come, but you just don't want to lock in because the devil's told you you're unworthy for certain. You're done. I mean, there are things you're struggling with. It's true. It's true. Welcome to the club. You're not the only one. But you, there was a very happy day when you were born. And all the things you'd go through, God knew. All the bad decisions you made, God knew. And he's not against you. He loves you. He really loves you. You've got to give him a chance to bless you and lift you up. Give him a chance to show himself to you. you. It's not someone else you haven't forgiven. It's you yourself. You refuse to forgive yourself for not being what you think you should be and all those. You've got to stop it today because you're a good man. You've got a good heart and God loves you. You're not here by chance. God chose you. God chose you. And you're a good man. You've got a lot of goodness in you. And you don't have to be everybody's friend. You've got to be a little more wise and choose your friendship. You can be friendly, but friendship must be a little more costly. And you'll be a good friend. There's a big change coming in your career. Somehow, uh, you're planning equipment, but there's other things. You're much more skilled in management, and there's a place that you belong that was taken from you. And that's going to be given back to you and then some more. But you've got to let God heal your heart first. It's very important that he can put you in the right place, that the victory comes from him, nobody else. You're actually a very brilliant man, very smart, very capable, and you can lead, you can really lead people. And that's what God's got for you. Do you understand? Don't see the bump in the road as failure. No, it's only a bump making you stronger. So you his wife, and what's your name? Alyssa, and this children, you have children, how many? Just the two. Elijah, we have Elisha. Elisha, somebody was Elisha. And then with Elijah, I think. Wow. We've got a lot of the prophets in the house. Huh? So, so how old are you, Elisha? Ten. And uh, what do you want to do with your life? What is your plan? Something what? You're thinking on it. All right, totally cool. You've got a wonderful heart, but you're super smart. Electronics is a big thing in your life, and you will do something as an electronic engineer of some kind. Very smart. You learn so fast, but you've got a very soft heart. Very tender. For a boy, you are extremely sensitive. And uh, that's doesn't, it's not a bad thing. It's going to make you be very used of God. And there's a strong, your name's no small thing, Elisha. You will be very prophetic in your life. Very. God will use you. And your mother invests a lot in your life, way too much sometimes. She used to back it, back it up, girl, back it up. <laughs> helicopter, yes, a helicopter. <laughs> uh, but you're a wonderful lady, very kind. You're a very giving person, and you want everyone to be happy. Not your job. Your job is to be a loving wife and a good mother as you are, but not to make everybody happy. That's God's job. Can we do that? All right. In your family, you always got on the phone, you're trying so hard to balance every, every act. It's just not, it's exhausting. You don't. Put the phone down. Just don't, don't ring. Don't even take the call. So it's getting to be annoying. <clears throat> I keep telling you, he says, I keep telling you. <laughs> and where's the other child? Oh, is this younger child? How, three. And what's her name? It's very strong, very strong. Well, she, she's she's going to run your house. She's going to run your house. That girl is brilliant, smart, powerful, born to lead. And I'm telling you, she'll be high profile in this, in this country. High profile. Got you, you, you brilliant. You had to pass, the, pass those genes down somehow. You had to pass them down. She's, not, she's smart too, but you are brilliant. You just don't realize that you're brilliant. 
If you don't, you must be every church service. Don't make me come back and look for you. <laughs> okay, good. Did you have anybody you thought I should minister to, Pastor, tonight before I yeah. shut, shut the baby down? No. Nope. Keep going. Keep going, yes. Do you know his name? What's his name? Stand there. Stand where you are. Both of you, stand up. <laughs> Did you repent of your sins? What's your name, sir? You didn't know your name? They can call you by name? Right. Troy? Yes. Troy. And are you, are you standing, ma'am? <laughs> yes, you are. Amazing. Thought someone cut your legs off. <laughs> so, so, what do you do for a living, ma'am? Uh, I'm a teacher. A school teacher. I went to school. <laughs> My best five years was grade six. I liked the teacher. So, what do you do, sir? A pastor, so you don't do a lot. <laughs> where's, your, where's your church? Brockton, Massachusetts. Brockton. Thank you for your faithfulness to the work of the Lord. I'm very grateful. Very grateful. Because we need all the workers we can get. I really, we really do. And so how many children do you guys have? Just one. Just one. You're not filling the earth yet? How old's your we child? Try. How old's your child? He's 14. 14, okay. So it's kind of a fight where you are, and it's, uh, you know, when God calls you, people must either follow or not. You can't, you're not employed by them. You're employed by God. And the moment you start to give in to their leadership, then you're not the leader anymore. And they need a, they need a pastor, they need a leader. They need a leader. You're not a pastor, you're a leader. They call you pastor, but you're really a leader. And you've stopped leading because it's been... Uh, too much stuff going on. And uh, it's better that the one who has the money leaves so God can send the right support and all the people that God wants to send to you because you've got a good ministry. You're a good teacher of the word. You care about people. You read situations well. You've helped a lot of people that have left. They shouldn't have left. And you're holding on to the wrong people. Let them go. Let them go so God can build his house. Because they, they are the obstacle in the way. And God's not broke. He's not poor. He'll take care of you. He'll shock you how well he's going to take care of you. He will shock you. As for you, ma'am, you're a delight and you do school, good job at school. But you smile and laugh. But you're carrying a, a burden in your heart for your husband. You care about those things and you want to you wanna help and do. And you don't know that you are called as much as he's called. But you actually are. You have a wonderful way of people, but you've kind of backed off because of some other stuff. But you are God's princess. There's no other way to describe you. Everything about you is fantastic. You're gifted. You, you can prophesy. You minister to people. You've been hurt by the Christians. You didn't hurt by the world. They in the church hurt you. And I'm sorry, but it's a part of that journey. He didn't promise you a pain-free, just healed life. And that's what he's promised you. And he's got you covered. He's got you covered. And you are in God's will. He's whispering to telling my ear, tell you the most important thing you've been doubting. Are we we're supposed to? Yes, you are. No one's going to run you guys off like a scalded dog. You're going to be champions there. You're going to pack the house. And you're going to get those young people in and change that band out. You're going to have such a lot of energy and music and wonderful life in that church. And it's going to be a brand new everything. It's God's plan for you. Don't you give up for one moment. People have got, got plans for God's got plans. Right? Thank you so much for the wonderful people you are. I really appreciate you, sir. Thank you so much. God bless you. All right. Thank you. Can I, can I give this to you? Thank you for letting me be here. I expect you to be here on Sunday. If you're not, I will find out where you live. <laughs> this is your Bible, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, if you didn't receive a word tonight... Come back on Sunday. But I think we received a corporate word. What do you think? Yep. That God really does have a plan for our life. Yeah. And that some of us are a lot more special than we realize, just like Elizabeth. You know, when the salutation was given, it made her baby jump. Mm -hmm. That's why it's good to be somewhere where the word of God is being spoken, because there might be something in, of emphasis in you that will, it, it will resonate 
and make your baby jump when you're hearing a word from the Lord. Sometimes I'll hear a prophecy that someone's getting and, and it'll speak to me too. Did that happen to anybody tonight? And I want to encourage you to do this. If you got a word that doesn't resonate, then be like the Bereans. Go home and pray and ask God, you know, God, what are you saying to me? There's been times I, I received words and that, that I had a hard time with. And, and then when I went home and prayed about it, and I was not hearing what was being said the way it was being said, or I was filtering it. And that's why it's good to just take time to really seek the Lord to God. What are you speaking to my heart? Amen. Praise God. Father God, we just thank you for the opportunity to be in your presence tonight. What a privilege to be where you're moving. Lord, I pray over every word that was given. Lord, that hearts would be open to you to continue to minister and speak. Lord, the spigot's been turned on that as the service ends, that doesn't mean it's been turned off. Continue to speak, continue to identify things in our lives that you want to do. Let that prophetic anointing be released and continue to flow. In Jesus' name, amen.